One of the things that I do as I prepare for a sermon is often look for uh, examples of what the fathers of the church in the early centuries preached, and then I'll look in the, in the Middle Ages or in the Reformation and then up to modern sermons and just see what the preachers have said over the years. Sometimes it gives you a, a great idea, something that you hadn't thought of or hadn't heard. And I began doing that to prepare for this sermon by looking back at uh, St. Augustine, the, the, probably the greatest preacher of the of the age. His uh, fifth century sermons are all still studied and, and used in teaching today. And the one I found on the parable of the rich fool, uh, the kind of the common title of what this bit of the gospel is about, was so harsh that I would have to go to North Africa if I wanted to preach it, I think. I, I didn't want to end up out in the street uh, before the sermon time was over. So I I abandoned the patristic era and decided to look in the 15th century, 16th century, and I found a wonderful sermon by the chaplain to the king. The king would be 13-year-old King Edward VI, when, and when the sermon was preached, it was by Hugh Latimer, one of the great Reformation theologians. Uh, Hugh Latimer was the chaplain to the king because the king's father, Henry VIII, had forced him to resign from being the Bishop of Worcester uh, because he defied some of the teaching and theological work of Henry VIII. Bad idea. Don't do that. Uh, And so he lost his time as bishop. But Henry VI, uh, through the intercession and work of Henry VI's godfather, Thomas Cranmer, uh, made sure that he had a good chaplain, and it was Hugh Latimer who did the the preaching. Latimer's sermon began with the repetition of one phrase three times. He said, beware of all forms of greed. Beware of all forms of greed. Beware of all forms of greed. And the king, 13-year-old Edward, and everyone heard this, and then he explained. He said, if you hear nothing else from my sermon during the next three to four hours that I am preaching, well, that's as as far as I went on reading Hugh Latimer's sermon. I, I was curious, and so I marked all of the text. This was online, so I marked all the text dropped it into a Word document, and Word counted 17,000 words. And I thought I would end up in the street over that one, too, and I would be, as Patrick likes to say, send us your forwarding address from San Saba. You'll like it out there. (laughs) So I simply went back to the text itself and thought there is something to be said about this here. And the first thing is to remind you that Concern for the poor, concern for the poor and care for the poor is one of the overriding themes in the gospel according to St. Luke. Uh, It is there from start to finish, and we'll touch on a few of those points as the sermon moves on, but this prominence of the theme of the poor uh, sets the stage for what Jesus says to a rich man who has a couple of problems. The man's riches are not the problem. The man is the problem, and his attitude is the problem. This all begins when a man in the crowd comes forward and says to Jesus, Jesus, I need you to settle this between me and my brother. He will not give his inheritance. He will not give me my inheritance. I'm entitled to this. You know, there's no evidence that it was fraudulent or anything else, but Jesus very quickly says, who made me judge over you? I have other work to do. I have other business to do. I'm not a municipal court judge or a probate judge. And then he says to the crowd and teaches them the story of the rich fool. The rich man, who was rich at the beginning of the story, becomes even more wealthy with the abundance of a great harvest. 
we have some wheat farming land in my family, and I know sometimes the harvest is great, 90 to 100 bushels. This year, there wasn't much rain, and the, take, uh, the, the yield of the land was only 43 bushels to the acre. So I know what this is like to see the variations in production. But he had such a banner year that his problem becomes immediately evident. Because as he describes the dilemma and as he talks about it, he doesn't take counsel from anybody. Did you notice? He says, to himself. He says, to himself, well, what am I going to do with all my stuff? And if you look, you can count the, uh, what some people call the aggressive pronouns, I and my, instead of the possessive. You can see 11 times that this man, in the space of a couple of sentences, talks about himself. Talks about himself. And it's very clear that among the things that he thinks about his riches, he doesn't think that there might be a way to share it or use it to good purpose with anyone other than himself. In fact, he ends up by saying to my soul, as he puts it, as if he owns that too, you've got, you're set for life now. You don't need to do a thing. We're just going to eat and drink and be merry. It's very clear to me that this rich fool that Jesus is talking about was not present when Jesus taught his version of the Beatitudes earlier in chapter 6 of the Gospel of Luke because he talks immediately in that about how blessed those who are hungry and poor and in need of every kind are and follows it right away with three or four verses of woe. And that's not W-H-O-A, that is W-O-E. Woe to the rich who are well-fed, who are not thirsty, who are laughing, who are well-clothed, because he's saying to them, that's all you're going to get. That's all there is in those possessions. That's why Jesus begins telling this story by saying, man's life, your life, my life, does not consist in abundance of possessions. And so he he moves on, Jesus moves on, and the man gets his second major indication of, that would be shock. Not only is he unable to think about anyone in this world other than himself, he doesn't think about anything other than this world because he's believing that somehow he's now set and will go on indefinitely on what he has. And so that's when God meets him and says, you fool, this night your life is over. This night your life is over. I like to tell people that we are all out of warranty from the first day, but apparently this man doesn't know that and doesn't think about that. He actually believes that he can control his destiny and speak to his soul as if it's actually his own. We know that nothing of this life is our own. We come with nothing we leave with nothing. The Spanish have a, a proverb. They say, there are no pockets in burial shrouds. Hmm. Worth thinking about. So here he is, laid bare, a man who can only think of himself and a man who thinks nothing of the world to come. And Jesus says and finishes the story with, beware of all greed. Beware of all greed. This is how it is when people lay up treasures for themselves and are not rich towards God. That's a terrible ending. This story actually reminds me in a lot of ways of Charles Dickens's Christmas Carol. And in fact, I wish we could have kept reading. The, the verse that is appointed for today ends where I stopped. But had we gone on, there's a lot of encouragement. But I think if we could see what the word of God coming to the, to the man who is foolish, he may have had time to repent. We don't know. Jesus leaves that part to our imaginations. In the Christmas carol, we get that nice ending where Ebenezer Scrooge comes to himself, recognizes his problems, repents of his selfishness, and 
goes and buys the Christmas goose and saves the dinner. If this sounds like I'm very familiar with this story, I am, because my youngest grandson played the part of Tiny Tim in the Victoria Trinity Church Christmas pageant. And it was an unforgettable performance in lots of ways. <laughs> but it, it's, it's what this, I wonder if Dickens used this parable of the rich fool as the source of what he's talking about. Because it's not the riches that are the problem, it's the use of them. It's the attitude towards them. It's the turning it in on yourself. And Jesus has some really encouraging words that follow right on this. As soon as he tells the story, the next line in the gospel says, and Jesus said to his disciples, and he goes on to talk about the lilies of the field and the birds of the air and how God knows what it is that we need and will make sure that those who follow him, those who seek his will, those who live in his paths will have what they need. And there's always a difference between what we need and what we want and all of those things. Don't want to get into that. There isn't time. That would take 17,000 words, and we don't want to do that. But there is this encouragement from Jesus to be not afraid of following him and thinking it's going to cost you more than you can afford. Discipleship costs you everything. You have to give up that sense of my barns and my crops and my goods and my soul, and you turn it all over to God. I I know how hard that can be, but this is encouragement not only for people who are reluctant to, to take the step of turning everything over to a whole different way of living, but it's also encouraging for those who have nothing by way of the world standards to turn them over because we all are in the same need of God's redemptive power. And those who have plenty to share will find that their brothers and sisters in Christ are ready to receive what God has given for the use of his people and for the good of this world. So Jesus has encouraged everyone here, and he's encouraging us as part of this beautiful body of Christ, which has all kinds of people in it and all kinds of people that we serve. The reason that we so focus on outside of ourselves activities, whether it's our outreach locally or our foreign mission, is because this is the pattern that God wants us to live. My kids used to go to a summer athletic camp, and one of the awards that was most sought after, the most prestigious awards, was not the greatest athlete. It was the third award. I'm third award. And it was God and others, and then me. And that's the whole pattern of what Christian life is supposed to be like. So we do that as the body of Christ because it is God's will. And we find this way of doing as we learned how to pray last week. Remember, we're on the road to Jerusalem here. We are learning, and we have been since the last time I preached six weeks ago and started a series of sermons on how to do the right thing on the road, how to choose the best part, how to pray, how to know who your neighbor is, all of those things that have been churning around. And today Jesus is telling us how to live in relationship to the stuff of this world. We're learning what it is to be the body of Christ. And so that as we pray, and we pray week by week, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we are becoming more and more in God's way of doing things. And that involves the sharing and the, and the idea of filling up the storehouse with our treasures and keeping it becomes less and less a part of who we are. And those who need more will discover the truth of what God actually does when we put him to the test. I know a little about that timidity about giving things up because nearly 50 years ago, uh, Terry and I were facing real discontent with what we were doing as newlyweds. We were 22 years old. I was in graduate school. I was all set for the second year of my master's program in urban planning. I had tuition remission for out-of-state fees. I had a 
teaching fellowship. I had free housing from the university. We had a lot of security. We were ready to eat, drink, and be merry in Wisconsin. That's supposed to make you laugh. <laughs> but we were going to do it. Madison is a lot of fun. But I was terribly unhappy and dissatisfied with what I was doing. Great security, but complete dissatisfaction. And what we realized was God was pulling us to the seminary over at Neshota House, just 45 miles away. But we didn't want to give up. We were afraid of what giving up our own plan might actually mean for us. We wondered how we would live. And I can recall very clearly sitting at dinner one night in Madison with Terry and talking about the lilies of the field and the birds of the air. And it was on that conversation that we said, we really don't have anything to fear. And we made the change. I guess it's worked out because we haven't looked back and have been very happy to be doing what God has called us into here. But it took some courage to say, we can actually believe God's word and do it. And those who are without find it even, even harder to believe. But it's our job to demonstrate the truth of God's promises as we do our best to provide what is needed. All of this is about growing in Christ, about the things that our renewal works are helping us discover about our strengths and how to enhance them. And we hope that more and more we'll simply grow into being the effective body of Christ who looks beyond itself, thinks about the world to come, and isn't afraid or eaten up by worry and anxiety that can paralyze it. Because we want to move forward in our faith, forward in our discipleship, to the point where our prayer really simply becomes, God bless us, every one. Amen.